Okay, I'm ready to start whenever you are. Let's Give go. Me, I'm um, here. Some quick audio levels. Just a testing one, two, three. Yep, mic check. One, two, one, two. Mic check. Mic okay. check. One, two, one, two. Mic okay. check. Perfect, perfect. Okay. All right, here we go. Special edition of Knicks Fan TV. Tonight's guest, he's one of my heroes of the 90s Knicks, man. He was with the team for three seasons and the starting point guard on the 1994 NBA Finals team. The floor general number 11, Derek Harper. Harp, thanks for joining, man. I, I really appreciate you Anytime. giving me the time. I would only do this for you. You're a swell guy. I like what you're doing. And uh, I'm here, right here for you. That, thanks again, man. So let's kick it off. So you started your career off with the Dallas Mavericks. Ten mm -hmm. years in as, as a point guard of the team. January 6, 1994, you find out that you traded to the New York Knicks. <laughs> What was yeah. that day like for you, and, and how did you try to process Whew. everything? Man, I, it was a tough process, to be quite frank with you. I, um, I, because you have kids. I had a family at the time, and my kids were very young, so the process was for me to try to explain to my kids that I'm getting ready to leave them and go to New York City. And the way that I was forced to do that was to show them the Mavericks record, at the time, which we were at the bottom of the Western Conference, fighting to not become one of the worst teams in NBA history, to going to New York, a team that was fighting to be a champion that was number one in the Eastern Conference. And um, with, with, with that, it was a little bit easier. But, you know, I, I don't know if people realize that when, when, case okay, it's time, when you get traded, it's time to go. You don't get a lot of time to you know, explain things to people. You jump on a plane basically the next day. You pack what you can in the moment, and you're in a different city, a different environment with a different organization. And that's the process. That's what I went through. And um, I want to say it was it was smooth, but it was everything but smooth. It, there was some bumps in the road, but all in all, it worked out. Got a chance to play for a championship. The harsh realities of the business, as you said. And yes. uh, you also mentioned, you know, you went from worst to first. Those Dallas teams were languishing near the bottom of the league for a number of years. Yes. Conversely, this Knicks team, they were on the brink. You know, they took the Bulls to seven games in 92. 93, mm -hmm. um, they win 60 plus games. So they have championship aspirations. Doc Rivers goes down with a knee injury, pressure cooker situation. What was that like for you? And what did you feel like you wanted to bring to the team to contribute? Well, to answer your what it was like question, in case it, it was a challenge, to be quite frank with you, because you just mentioned worse to first. Um, when you come from a team, just so I can enlighten people a little bit, when you come from a team that's not a good team in the NBA, you have different habits and you're not accustomed to coming early and staying late when it comes to practice. And as much as I prided myself on being a professional, I tried to do that and tried to be that guy being in the league for, for what, 10, 11 years almost at that juncture in my career. It was, it was a challenge because when I got to New York first, I mean, you said that they were first. They were first in the Eastern Conference at that particular moment. And, you know, I, I remember vividly, man, one of the, one of the things that, that shocked me into, into the present was doing practice. My first, second practice at SUNY Purchase up in uh, uh, Westchester County my first practice, man, I was reaching down. There was a loose ball on the floor, and I was reaching down for the ball, not, not getting on the floor, not, not really animated and aggressive and trying to get that loose ball. And then here comes Mace and Oak, <laughs> Greg Anthony. They took, took my legs from under me, diving for the loose ball. And that was the difference right there. I mean, I, I came from a team that was trying to be trying to keep from being, again, the worst team in NBA history in Dallas. And we were just doing things a little bit different. We weren't really diving for loose balls and, and, and trying to be at the, the peak of our games at that particular time. And I learned very quickly that it was a whole different situation. And I, I'm going to be honest with you, man. I, I struggled my first eight to ten games. You can do the numbers 
I'll never forget Pat Riley sitting all of us down. Coach Riley set us down underneath the basket one day at practice. And he started to define roles. He started to talk about what his expectation was for, for each individual as a player. And when he got to me, I was totally embarrassed because I wasn't living up to what Coach Riley had uh, traded for. Um, I know knew Coach Riley from his Laker days. I was a nemesis for some of his basketball teams back in the day. So he had high expectations for me, but it took me some time. New York is the mecca of basketball when it comes to the NBA. And the fans had high expectations. So I'll never forget, Case okay, coming to the bench sometimes, and fans just like, Harper, how long is it going to take you? Like, this is <laughs> – I hope this is not what we traded for. Blah, blah, blah. The, the, the beat went on and on. And finally, man, I, I just continued to work. I stayed the course of w what I was and who I was, and things finally came, came around for me. But to start, I have to be real honest and open with you, man. It was a struggle mm. playing in Madison Square Garden initially. It's that welcome to New York moment. And as yes, you said, the team kind of let you know that, you know, these yes, are the expectations. Right the you you got to get in it no to question. win it. Very yes. interesting, man. And now in the room – this was Patrick Ewan's team, the superstar, all yes. NBA player, all Absolutely. star. Again, he's in his prime. He's he's ready to take it there and bring that chip home. What was that like for you in terms of trying to develop that chemistry very rapidly with Patrick to to you know really fit you know, in? You know, Beast was the guy. You know, he and John were the two options on our our team as far as offense was concerned. Um, you know, I made some comments doing an interview that I think were kind of taken out of context. I said it, so I have to own it. Mm. However, you know, it, the question was about Patrick as a leader, things of that nature. And I, there's no way that I can say Patrick Ewan was not a leader. I, I just feel like, and it didn't come across this way, maybe, that they're different kind of leaders. And if you look at a vocal leader, then he's in everybody's face. That was Oak. Oak was always in everybody's face. He was always holding guys accountable, you know, just, just making sure that you're ready to go night in and night out. Patrick led by example. And I, I, I just think that when people talk leadership, they always think that the best player has to be the all-out leader. Just not, not true. Um, case in point, you you think that if you're the leader, you got to take the, win, the the shot at the end of every game. Not true. You have to make the right play at the end of games. That's what basketball is all about. How many times have you seen the best players, Case, make the right play opposed to making the basket? Right. And in 94, I just thought there were not enough plays being made by our best players opposed to trying to make the basket. And I really want to want to want to emphasize and, and clear that up. That's mm -hmm. exactly what I was trying to say. Maybe I wasn't clear on it that particular moment when I was being interviewed at the time, but Patrick was a leader by example. I mean, I love Beast. We, 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 we have a friendship, we have a relationship, and it was not to try to belittle him in mm -hmm. any kind of way that he wasn't a great player, that he didn't have a great career. I mean, heck, or hell, the guy was an all-star, five, six, eight, ten-plus years, all pro a couple of times. And actually, we, we played in the finals together. So what Patrick was to, to the New York Knicks spoke for itself. He doesn't have to explain to anybody what, what he was as a player. and mm. His career was uh, second to none to most centers that ever played the game. That's exactly right. He, he was a warrior. And uh, it was our interview with Oakley where Oakley, you know, said Young yeah. was was high maintenance that kind of set off a yeah. firestorm. And, yeah, what does uh, that, that and, and I love yeah. Oak, but that doesn't have anything to do with leadership. Mm -hmm. You think these players today aren't high maintenance guys? Of course they are. Every, you know, you, you have to make things as comfortable as possible for your best player. And if you tell me that people say you treat everybody the same or coaches or organizations treat everybody the same, I would tell you, Casey, that that's a lie. That's just not true. Mm -hmm. uh, superstars deserve 
supreme um, attention. Mm -hmm. And they earn that. They earn that right. Patrick earned that right as a player. And like I said, I just think that when you're really the guy, Mm -hmm. you have to make other people around you better. And if you look at the finals in the bubble that just passed, Anthony Davis, LeBron James, Well, the one night Anthony Davis hit the bucket and there were a lot of nights that other guys stepped up for the Lakers team. And to me, that's really how they were successful. Miami didn't have enough. Houston didn't have enough. Who else did they play? The Nuggets, whoever. Mm -hmm. They just didn't have enough because I think LeBron and Anthony Davis together, they're going to they're going to be the kings. They're going to end up better than everybody else. But I just. When I look at LeBron, I look at Michael Jordan, how many times did he find Steve Kerr for the open shot, John Paxson for Mm -hmm. the open shot? I just feel like if we had played that way a little bit more, then we would have been champions in 94 against a very good Rockets team. Can't take anything away from them. But we all we needed was to win one out of two games, and we would – would have been crowned champions and I would still be in New York hanging out with you, not on Zoom. You know what I mean? That's right. So that's, that's right. you got to make the right play. That, yeah. That's what I think everybody gets confused. People think the best player is always supposed to make the shot. Mm-hmm. You know, Patrick missed that layup against the Pacers uh, in the, the following year in 95. Mm-hmm. And everybody is like, oh, my God, oh, my God. But that's how it happens. I mean, you you're not going to always make that shot. But if you make the right play, you're going to be more successful, in my opinion, just from my experiences as a player in the league. You being the newcomer on the team, did you feel like it was a challenge for you trying to, you know, rein them in a little bit as a floor general? Or do you feel like just some superstars, they're just going to do what they do? Well, Patrick is going to do what he does because he's a scorer. He's a back to the back player. He can face up. Patrick had a unique skill ability. He could handle the ball decent enough to create his own shot. And, I mean, again, the guy's a Hall of Famer, so he doesn't have to explain anything to us. But what I tried to do was just help him to recognize that if there are two or three guys on you, then that means somebody else is open. Mm -hmm. And they're going to get a more quality offensive opportunity than you would trying to shoot over one or two guys or two and a half guys, whatever the case might be. See, again, that's where, and I'm not, Patrick is a very intelligent basketball player, but that's where winning and losing separates itself. If you make the play, you know, if you make the game easy for somebody else, then down the stretch of a game case, if you would, it's going to be easier for you. If he finds me open, finds John open, Hubert Davis, Greg Anthony, Whoever it might be, if he finds us a couple of times and we make the defense pay by knocking down a few baskets from the perimeter, then that's going to free him up to be the dominant person that he was. And, um, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. man. This is what? That was 94, so we're talking (laughs) 26 years ago. You know what I mean? And it took me a long time. I'm not going to lie to you, man, to get over not winning in 94 because I think we were the better team against the Rockets. Elijah Wan, Kenny Smith, Sam Cassell, Robert Ory, Mario Ellie, those guys deserved it because again, they went back to back, but nobody, I'll have a hard time being convinced that we weren't the best team at that particular moment, just didn't find a way to make enough plays and, and, and bring the cohesion to the point where, we 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 were gonna uh, we were gonna play for each other. I, I didn't think that we played for each other mm. enough, and Houston did. That's why they were crowned champions. Very, very interesting, and certainly want to touch on six and seven uh, in a in a bit. But just leading up to the finals in that playoff run, one of the things that that really caught my eye as a young kid was identity of the team and how much it really embraced New York and, and what's the lifeblood of the city. You know, your signature or the team signature was, was the baldies, the, the, the shaved heads, the black shoes and the black socks. You <laughs> yeah, know, that you came, you came in with some hair, you know, you had that, that Dallas yeah. high top fade going. That tired, that it wasn't a high top, it was a tired fade. <laughs> <laughs> I was losing my, my hair was thinning at the The time. landing strip, right? <laughs> yes. I, I knew nothing but that haircut and, I tried to hold on to it, man, as long as I could. 
And when we got to the playoffs, we were in Charleston, I think, South Carolina is where we went to prep for the uh, for the playoffs. And I started hearing little rumors that to kind of form and build team unity that we were going to shave, everybody was going to shave their heads. And going ball already, I'm like, shit, I'll do it. <laughs> <a> Why not? <laughs> I, don't, I don't have anything to lose, right. you know? So I jumped on the idea. I think it was Oak's idea. It was Oakley's idea, Herb Williams maybe. But we decided to shave our hair, our, our heads. And John and Patrick were the only ones that did. People have their own personal reasons to why they don't want to <laughs> shave, shave their, their hair. Every human being in the world knows what they look like. Thanks. Ball, yeah, right? Yeah. Me, you, we know what we look like. Mm -hmm. So some, the only two guys that didn't do it was Patrick and was John. And they, they went low, but they didn't go all the way, <laughs> way low. There are some... Uh, some Kroger commercials flying around about getting low. Nobody, John and Patrick didn't want to go too low as far as the haircuts was concerned. But I thought it was a great gesture, a great idea, because there's nothing like team chemistry and bringing mm -hmm. guys together, being on one page when you're trying to accomplish what we were trying to oh, accomplish. Yeah, I, I loved it. I loved it, man. And uh, so now you guys get past the Nets, the Bull Series. Now here mm -hmm. comes game three. <laughs> You're out there, <laughs> all of a sudden He's camera up. pans over, and it's you and yeah. JoJo English in a full-out yeah. bench-clearing brawl. What happened, yes. man? First of all, I apologize to everybody, all parties involved. I've seen JoJo since, and I've personally uh, apologized to him. Of course, under those circumstances, you have to – I had to apologize to my mother for crying out loud. <laughs> she flew into that particular game, and she doesn't get to see me play her. She and my sister – had to apologize to the team, for the staff, for the city of New York, period, mm. because you're putting your team in jeopardy of coming up short a little bit when it comes to what we were trying to accomplish mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. But just to set the record straight, uh, JoJo English checks into the game, case, okay, and we had an altercation, and he walked up to me and told me he was going to whoop my ass. <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to say what he said to me. And I don't know about where you I, – I know you're from New York or New Jersey or wherever. I'm from Florida. And if somebody comes at you and approaches you that way, it's fighting time. Yeah. It's the hell with every, <laughs> everything else, the hell with the playoffs, the hell with what's the nature at hand. It's time to go. So I simply said to him, no hell you won't whoop my ass. And he came towards me, man, and the melee started. <laughs> it, it, it's just that simple. <laughs> You know, part of me is ashamed of it because it, it wasn't the right example. Mm -hmm. um, but I would do it again. If he came at me the way he came at me, I would do it all over again. I would brawl with him and hope and pray that Hubert Davis makes those shots and those free throws when we got got to game four or game whatever game it was and that my guys had my back, which they did. They came through in spite of me not being there. And the beat goes on, man. And, and you guys were able to get past the Bulls in that series. Yes. And, uh, yeah, and every one of those Nick Brawls back in those days, everybody was in the mix from the coach, whether it was Riley to Van yeah. Gundy, Ewing yeah. was always involved, Oakley was always throwing people, Starks was man, somewhere me, in the crowd fighting fans or something, yeah. security guards. Yeah. So let everybody me, uh, was in. Let, let me touch on that case, man. Yeah. Let me tell you, I, I played on a lot of teams. I played in L.A. with Shaq and Kobe. Um, I played with the Mavericks, Mark Aguirre, most underrated small forward mm. or basketball player ever to play in the league. Rolando mm. Blackman, anytime I go down in the alley or get in a place where I need support and somebody to have my back, I'll take Ro, I'll take Mark, I'll take Roy Tarpley, I'll take Sam Perkins, mm. Brad Davis, I'll take those guys with me. Mm. So I have a lot of respect for those guys and what they brought to the game. But when I joined the Knicks team, man, it was war. <laughs> and Charles Oakley and Anthony Mason and John Starks, Anthony Bonner, Charles Smith, you, Greg Anthony, you name it. I would go to war with those guys every single night. And I'm not going to sit here and paint the perfect picture. I don't think case guys necessarily liked each other, mm -hmm. but we did play for each other. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's huge at, at that level. You have to play for each other and you have to have – 
your 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 brother's back in that mm-hmm. situation. And that's how I felt. I felt like everybody on that team had my back if it came down to that. So again, big ups to all those guys that I played with in New York for two and a half years. Memorable times indeed, man. Now, Eastern Conference Finals, you're coming up against the Pacers. Uh, pivotal yes. game six, you guys back against the wall. You had a crucial, crucial fourth quarter that really led the team to victory. Come back yes. to the Garden for game seven and, and close them out. What was uh, that energy, that atmosphere like at MSG <laughs> when, when you guys have finally got the Surreal. Job the word that comes to mind, the thought that comes to mind is just surreal. I think everybody that was involved as far as players are concerned, um, loan for that moment. Every child growing up as a basketball player wanted to play in the NBA Finals. I was no different. And I think that's why I was able to step up as a player because I've always wanted that opportunity to be on that stage. I'm full of stories, man, because I've had a lot of time to uh, to uh, digest all of this and everything that, that has gone on throughout my career. We were in the locker room getting ready for game seven. Coach Rowley gets up and gives one of those, uh, golly, John Wooden speeches <laughs> where he's he's going in, he's trying to express the importance of a game seven. He had been in more than any of us mm-hmm. have been in with the Lakers. Pat Riley is a, a, a winner, a killer. He's the godfather, plain and simple. So all of a sudden, okay, so we, we, we see, we, I started hearing noise. I started hearing paper balled up and chairs kind of moving around. And I don't know if you can guess or not who it was, but it was Oak, man. I, I mean, <laughs> out of all people, it was Kane. It was it was Charles Oakley sitting over in the locker room, man, just like almost in a frenzy of being kind of like mad almost. <laughs> and, and Oak simply said to, to Coach Riley and to the rest of the team, like, what the fuck, man? If we're not ready for a game seven to get to the NBA championship, we're never going to fucking be ready. Let's go play. And we got up after that, man. We went out to the uh, to the floor in which we were able to uh, knock the Pacers off. And, uh, again, that's why I say Oak is the guy. Mm. I mean, he when you start talking about an individual that, that number one, he stood for something. You know, mm. Oak didn't just go along with the flow mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Of, of what everybody else thought he should have gone. He, he, he kind of ruffled feathers sometimes. I mean – Whatever he said about Patrick, whatever he said about me, whatever he said about John, he said it in our faces. And he meant everything that he said, good, bad, or indifferent. So you have to respect that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of times it was his leadership, man, that really brought us back in games, kept us in games. And I have a lot of respect for for Charles for that. The the images at MSG was uh, unforgettable as a kid. You know, Ewing um, celebrating with the fans. You and the fan, yeah. you and the crowd high five and everybody yeah. Big time, and man. racing out Big there. Time. I'm family. getting goosebumps right now. Bro. Yeah, no, nothing, nothing it's like it, man. N- nothing like yeah. it at all. So now comes the Rocket series. Uh, you guys are able to split the two games in Houston again. Big game by you in Game Two to bring it back to the Garden for the three uh, game yes. set. You guys are able to take two out of three there. Up 3-2 in the series, mm. you had to be thinking, you know, you had be to be champion. feeling good. You had to be feeling good about it. I mean, what were you <laughs> thinking going like, to Houston that time? Man, I, I if somebody, I don't know, they call me naive, but I still don't believe that we lost that series. <laughs> and we did lose the series, right? How crazy is that? But I – um. Man, I I just thought we were the better team. I I just thought pound for pound, the thing that kept us from winning is because we got caught up in personal Mm. opposed to team. Mm. Um, John, I love him. And I take full responsibility for not playing a bigger leadership role down the stretch of games in that series. Mm. Because I'm the point guard. And for me, for me, I was the guy that got got the ball to John. Certainly he was supposed to, on a lot of occasions, dump the ball into Patrick and we play from there. But I I just feel like looking back, I should have done something different 
and done more as an individual point guard to uh, to help my basketball team, man. Mm-hmm. I, I, I honest to God, it, like I said, it took me a long time to get over that series. And you talk about just needing to win one game out of two. I, I just knew it would happen. I, I, I knew it would happen. They made more players. Sam Cassell, yeah. I mean, you're talking about a nemesis yeah. for, for us in that series. In game six and game seven, he was. Mm-hmm. Uh, Vernon Maxwell, Robert Ory hit some big baskets down the stretch of that particular series and in, in, in game six and in game seven. But I, I, I still feel like in a lot of ways, Case, we beat ourselves. Mm. I, I just don't think there was enough enough camaraderie for us. You know, because a lot of times, you know, you, you think about it this way, man, and, and maybe this is a book, but Hubert Davis, great outside. John was two for 19, right, in, 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 in game seven or game six, whichever one it was. I, I I'm drawing it all runs seven. together. Yeah, seven, for six, me right six. Now. I mean, he, he actually he played uh, well. He played well. Twenty-seven points, sixteen six. in the fourth. That's exactly right. Just couldn't get but it in over. Game Elijah seven, one. he struggled. So, I, I, somebody else should have gotten an opportunity, in mm. my opinion. Do you feel like it was Orlando Hubert? It could have been you, Casey. It could have been anybody. Mm. I, I, I'm not saying who it should have been. <laughs> it could have been Ro. I mean, Rolando Blackman. I know from playing with him mm-hmm. against the Rockets throughout our career was a rocket killer. Mm. And I have numbers to back it up. You Mm. can Google his numbers against the Houston Rockets and you would know what he did against the Rockets. He was sensational. Mm. Hubert Davis was a knockdown shooter from the perimeter. And I just think that all of those things forced us to kind of, and and I don't want to get carried away. I not, not root for each other, but I think guys that weren't getting their opportunity wanted their opportunity mm. to the point where they, 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 not that they wanted you not to do well, but they wanted their right. opportunity, they wanted if more. that makes sense. Right, right. You know, like, okay, he Harp is struggling, so give me a chance right. if you're great. Mm-hmm. Rolando, Hubert. John is struggling, so give me a chance. And it's human nature, yeah, man. Everybody yeah. wants their night uh, under the lights, man. Mm-hmm. When un- under the circumstances of trying to be tr- crowned a champion, and I just think that's that's that became our nemesis as far as winning it all. Certainly unfortunate, man. And and there's there's a shot from the TV broadcast after seven where it's just you on the bench. And I believe yes. everybody had went back to the locker room. It's you on the bench. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Heading your hands. I remember it like it was yesterday. What, what do you remember the, those emotions like Man, just from I, there I, and I, in the I, locker room? You know, I and I should have shared this earlier, I guess, but <laughs> walking over from the summit is, well, walking to, getting to the arena, getting to the arena of the summit. I, um, I, I walked in the arena, little earbuds or earphones in, blah, 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 trying to get focused and get myself ready for game seven. I, of all people, saw the champagne being wheeled wow. into the arena. <laughs> I experienced it. I saw that. And all I could think Case, was, man, in two hours, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a sip. Yeah. I'm going to get it poured all over me. I'm going to be able to celebrate. And all I could think back on was, guys celebrating spraying the champagne all over each other and what went through my mind is that experience didn't come to fruition man it it didn't happen and i don't regret a lot about my career Mm -hmm. honestly i really don't It, it, it was it was it was fun 16 years but the one thing that i i i really have to say i regret the most was was not winning that championship man because you know as well as I know, it's been it was 73, 74 since the Knicks have been crowned champions. Mm-hmm. And Walt Frazier, Earl the Pearl, those guys are still beloved in the city of New York. Yeah. And I just feel like I would be in New York today, 2020, still sharing that stage with the all-time great Knicks, man. And it bothers me that I didn't get that, that opportunity. Walt Frazier was my favorite player growing mm-hmm. up as a kid. And I told Clyde that, you know, I, 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 when I, when I first saw him, I remember expressing that to him and, um, 
just not being able to reach that that the pinnacle of of of, of a professional uh, basketball player by winning a championship, man, bothers me more than anything that I that, that I've, I've ever experienced as a player. I've had a lot of great moments as a player. Hey, you guys would have been immortalized, as you said. But uh, yes, you know the city. We we still love you guys, and I'm sure you still you know get that same admiration when you come I back. Come, to my MSG daughter's in New Dallas. York. I come yeah. to New York, and I it, it it blows them away. Like, how do people still remember you? And I'm like, <laughs> this is New York, baby. That's people it. don't forget in New York. There's nothing but love when you start talking about playing basketball in New York City. I'll never forget taking my son to Harlem mm -hmm. a couple of times when we lived in New York. And what I'll say from those experiences is that the best players aren't in the NBA. Because there were some guys <laughs> over there man, that did nothing but ball out. That's man. right. And then, you know, you, you think about Earl the Pearl, you think about some of the all-time greats out of out of New York City, man. It, it, it was a great treat to play in the city of New York, man. And, you know, Pat Riley's impact on this team cannot be understated. Um, you know, just his whole NBA career. And, and it yes. was once again put on display in the bubble, just just his recent success with this Miami team. And yes. I like to say that he practically rebuilt that team almost four times over since he left the Knicks. Um, what, what did you learn from him during your stint with the Knicks? A lot. How, uh, man, I mean, I, I can truly say, man, I love Pat Riley. I mean, real man love I have for Riley. Because uh, I don't think there was any coach that was ever as prepared as Coach Riley. I mean, I you used to you 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 could look at Coach Riley, and you could see it. He wore it on his face. Okay, said he didn't sleep a lot as a coach, as an executive. This guy's always putting the work in. He believed in in outworking every opponent. Um, a genius. I mean, just a thinker, a guy that thinks outside of the box. I, I, I learned everything from him. I, you know, Dick Mata was my first coach, so mm -hmm. I'll always have a unique love for him. But my favorite coach, um, it, it was Riles, man, mm -hmm. because he knew what I could do. He came to get me from Dallas. I mean, I was struggling. We talked about the struggles early. Mm -hmm. And for him, Dave Checkett, Ernie Grunfield, to pull the trigger – on making me a Nick, they had to believe in me, number one. Everything's a gamble. All right. And we got to the finals. We got to seven games in the finals. Mm -hmm. And Coach Riley gave me the freedom to go out there, man, and be myself. Uh, and there were times where he would secretly give me a bump or give me a pat on the back to go for it because mm -hmm. I think Riles knew what I could do as a player. He knew me very well. From our, uh, our, 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 from competing mm -hmm. in the West, uh, in the Western mm -hmm. Conference, we went to the conference finals, the semifinals against each other a lot, and uh, I, I have a lot of love and respect for Pat Riley, man, just the way he approaches being one of the all-time great coaches. You know, people don't remember Coach Riley played in the league, mm -hmm. wasn't a star player, but he obviously knew what it took from a leadership standpoint. From a coaching standpoint, he knew what it took, and he knew he had to. Uh, he knew how to bring different personalities together, man. Mm -hmm. Because there were times, man. I, 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 I would challenge any coach that's ever coached to coach Anthony Mason. <laughs> R.I.P. That's my guy. I said, too. Charles to Mason. Oakley, yeah, Patrick yeah. Ewing, John Starks. Yeah. The personalities that we had on that particular team in '94, '95. They were a handful, including <laughs> <alpha> myself. Dogs. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. It was too many alpha dogs. Alpha, I'm an alpha dog. Yeah. You probably are too. Okay? But you can have too many alpha dogs. Yeah. And we had yeah. maybe we had too many, man. Yeah. And uh Coach Riley dealt with them in a very uh very unique and special way. Interesting indeed. Now, after the finals, um, a lot of the fans had come back and thought, you know, the non-Nick fans and non-Rockets fans, that it was very boring finals. They said it was too much physicality, too much emphasis on the defense. So the lead comes in now. They prohibit the hand check from uh, right. one end line to the opposite free throw line. As you finish playing and now you're into the color commentary and you see the game evolve and be more catered, 
uh, to offense, a guy that prided himself on defense and the hand check. Yeah. How, how do you view today's game? <laughs> it's a good game. The game is in a good place. There are a lot of talented basketball players out here, man. I don't mm-hmm. think anybody can deny that. But mm-hmm. I, I think from then to now, I, I think what the biggest difference is it's more entertaining. I mean, when you think about the execs that come and pay the big money for the floor seats that's sitting down on the floor, what do they want to see? They want to see scoring. Yeah. They want to see guys knocking down threes, uh, slam dunks. They don't want to see bully ball. They don't want to see Rick Mahorn, <laughs> Charles Oakley, Xavier McDaniels. Um, they don't want to see fights. They don't want to see wrestling and, and, and boxing, and I respect that. But I wouldn't change the era that I played in mm. because it, it lent itself to what I was as a player, hard nose. I mean, if I could have played my whole career, and this is not to slight the Mavericks, I'm a Maverick at heart as well because mm. that's where I was drafted. Mm-hmm. But the style of play that fitted my game and fitted me the best was the New York Knicks style. Mm. And it, ha- it started way before I got there. I remember watching X and Michael Jordan, Hedy headbutt each other mm-hmm. I, I after i left i remember jeff hanging on the leg of alonzo <laughs> morning like you said earlier case, sure. it, everybody was down for the cause at that particular time mm-hmm. man and that's how i will always remember new york and the style of play suited the players that were on that team you look at the game now if you touch a guy it's a foul yeah. if you, you you look at a guy they're calling foul so there there's a lot more entertainment but from a competitive standpoint I mean, we we had the best era. There are a lot of guys that play in the era today that couldn't play when I was playing. And everybody tries to say, who's the GOAT and who's this and who's that? And one of the things that makes Michael Jordan the GOAT of all time is because that guy had a competitive nature and the the way he gained it and where he got it from was being beat up by Mm -hmm. the Pistons Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for year after year after year. You had to earn your championships back then. And I'm not saying fighting is is cool and the right way to go about playing basketball, but man, you had to be tough. Mm. And I look at New York as a tough city. You had to be tough to win a championship in the eighties, man. Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, Robert Parrish, tough. The Pistons, Mahorn, Sally, Rodman, Isaiah, Joe, tough. Yeah. And that's what it that that's what it's all about, man. And that's not to take anything away from LeBron and from the era right now, from the Warriors. But come on, man. Everybody says those guys would have done the same thing. I I don't know. I beg to differ. Not 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 as easy. They wouldn't have they wouldn't have done it as easy as they do it right now. Blood, sweat, and tears. It was a, it was a well earned victory it. back in those in days. In a nutshell, yeah. brother. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I sir. certainly appreciated it. Now. You later on in your career, um, 98-99 lockout shortened season, you remember the Los Angeles Lakers, and that team was yeah. led by a superstar in Shaquille O'Neal and a budding mm-hmm. superstar in the late, great Kobe Bryant. And uh, Kobe's loss was certainly something that really magnified, mm. you know, this year. This was certainly a year of, of yeah. challenges and loss. Um, Kobe's passing is, is still hard to, to get over. Yeah. What, what were your favorite memories of, <sighs> of a young Mamba back during that time? Man, just how hungry the kid was, man. Just, uh, I, I, I'll tell you another story, man. Like I said, I, you know, when you're in it, you just have different moments that you've experienced with guys. And the one thing that I'll never forget about Kobe, who I became very, very good friends with, if you would, uh, because I was an old man and he was a young kid and the kid was eager as hell to learn and to get better. Mm. He used to beg guys to play one-on-one with him. Eddie Jones, uh, Derek Fisher, anybody, beg him. Like, please, I want to play one-on-one before (laughs) practice. So I'm looking at him walk around, challenging people, man, wanting to play one-on-one, just wanting Reuben Patterson, you name it. Nobody wanted anything to do with him. Like, this dude crazy, man. We got to practice before before this, blah, blah, blah. So me being an old man and and, and having nothing to lose, I said, okay, shit, I'll go. I'll play one-on-one with you, Kobe. Come on, man. So I'm thinking we're going to go over here and kind of go through the motion of playing a little before practice one-on-one man when i tell you the guy went at it like it was it was (laughs) 
the NBA <laughs> Finals, man. I was like, whoa. And there was one moment, Case, where he elbowed me here in my chin, on the side of my chin. Uh. And, you know, being, being a veteran, being a guy that had been around, that had paid some dues, that was respected, I wanted to fight the kid. <laughs> I really did. I'm just like, man, I know you didn't elbow me like that. And Kobe is the only guy that I know that got taped, man, before practice. Mm. And when everybody else was getting ready to leave, he would go back and get taped wow. after practice to work on his oh, individual yeah. game. Yeah. So for those that think he lucked or, or just so happened to be great, he did it. Kobe worked harder than any NBA basketball player that I know. Mm. And I know Michael Jordan worked hard. All greats work hard. Mm -hmm. Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, Wilt, Kareem, Bill Russell, Jabbar, everybody. All guys work hard, man. But none like Kobe Bryant, man. This, this dude was – this he was a workaholic, man. Mm -hmm. And that's why Kobe was so great. Like everybody, I was flabbergasted after mm -hmm. learning that he, he, uh, he and his daughter were not going to be with us any longer. But mm – -hmm. Man, I, I respect that guy, man. I, he, he's a prime example of you don't luck in, Casey, if you would, to being great. You have to work yeah, yourself work. into being great. Yeah. And that's what he was, one of the all-time greats by far. So so you got to see the the developments of the black mamba, the, the young baby mamba. You saw the fangs starting to come out, man. He caught you with a bow, man. That's an old school move, right? There. Yeah, he, he, <laughs> he caught me with everything. He's from Philly, <laughs> and he was a rap. Phenomenal, <laughs> love rap music. Yeah, and he started talking to me about Jigga, <laughs> and I knew nothing about Jigga. <laughs> so I'm, I'm one of Jay Z's biggest fans because of Kobe because Bryant. Of Kobe. Man. He wow. put me down, telling me that lyrically Kobe Bryant, uh, Jay Z, had more lyrics than Biggie, than Pop, <laughs> than everybody that exists. So I love Jigga right now. Man, because that's, of Kobe, man. That's, that's my guy. That's a funny story, man. Very interesting yeah. story. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Yes, um, sir. Uh, final two questions. Christoph Porzingis, former Nick. You've gotten yes. a chance to see him now for a full season. Another knee injury, this time the meniscus. What's been your overall impressions of KP, and, and are you concerned with, with this latest development? No, not concerned with, mm -hmm. with the surgery that he had because it, you said meniscus. And that's one that you can recover from. Russell had it. A lot of guys have had it. Mm -hmm. Russell Westbrook had it. Right. And he's come back and hadn't really skipped a beat as far as his health is concerned, his explosiveness, things of that nature. But when I see KP, man, when he finally got healthy, I just see skill mm -hmm. and a very talented big man. He was an all-star before he went down to injury. And I always say, man, that system is important for young, talented players. And I think the Mavericks system really fits him extremely well. Uh, Rick really uh, likes guys that can shoot the basketball, mm -hmm. score the basketball, that just have a unique skill set to be successful as a player. KP has that. And you talk, you, you know, Case, the only thing that's going to hold this guy back is being healthy. Yeah. If he's healthy, he's going to be an all-star. He's going to be a guy that really helps the Mavericks organization to be in the conversation about winning the championship because you couple him with Luka Doncic and you have a dynamic duo, man, that, that can compete against Anthony Davis and LeBron James. And I'll, I'll say this. All you have to do is look at the games where the, the other great duos played against the Mavericks. Luka and when KP was healthy, held their own well the Mavs certainly have that infrastructure in place to uh you know accommodate his development should Good he stay healthy certainly yes, something sir. that I wish the Knicks you know are on the right path with with Leon Rose and Thibodeau <laughs> I, I hope we're laying the yes. foundation finally hop to to really start on the <laughs> development track and not try to fast track yeah. this thing with with false hope you know I um I hope so too and I'll say a couple of things uh number one I think uh, they hired the right guy I'm a big Thibodeau fan. I think he's a no-nonsense coach. They have a very young basketball team, and I think that's what it takes is a coach that will hold guys accountable, not only offensively. I think offense in the league, when you have talent, it takes care of itself. 
but the other side of the basketball is more important than than than, than just going out scoring scoring points. You know, they they they've made the change. They they've added some different uh, front office people. Uh, you talked about Rose. You talked uh, West Worldwide West is a part of things as far as trying to get talent in into New York. I'm not a hater, man. I don't know how to hate. I'm an old school <laughs> throwback guy. So I, I love all, I love it all. I love my time in New York and I'm always pulling for the Knicks to get things turned around. Um, they should have hired me too. They should have <laughs> gave me a shot to come and help things out in New York. I would have, I would have added something different. Yeah, listen, we certainly could have used the help with the point guards, man. They don't call Clyde. Yes. They just let Clyde call the games from the sidelines. They never call him into a practice, but. Why not call why not call Clyde? Why not call Clyde? You know, but, but Clyde is you talking about the Godfather? Yeah, he, he, he he's one of the Godfather. Yeah, no question. Ho- hopefully, Leon will will uh, issue an, an invitation. But uh, yes, la- sir. Last question to you, Harp. You know, uh, Hubert Davis went on record to say you were one of the hardest uh, working people he had ever known. You know, we had Charlie Ward in our show, and and he gave you a lot of credit. Um, for aiding him, his development in his rookie year and really just being a stabilizing force for him, you know, yeah. a country boy coming into the big city of, yeah. of New York. Yeah, um, yeah. When, when it's all said and done, how do you want your legacy to be defined? How do you want Derek Harbour to, to be remembered? Man, first of all, I love both those guys. Real humble, young kids when I came to New York. Um, I, I It's not how I would want it if you would, it, it's how it's going to be. I mean, just mm. a no nonsense player that left every ounce on the floor. That simple. Um, respect it. Maybe not as much when it comes to making the all-star team, things of the individual accomplishments. But if you go and you talk to my peers, which is Hubert Davis, which is Charlie Ward, Magic Johnson, Isaiah, Michael, Ask those guys who Derek Harper was, and I think you'll get the true answer of how I'll be remembered as a basketball player. Well said, man. And as I said, for the fans, you, you left an indelible mark on, on yes. this franchise and this fan base. We were right there. Uh, and, and and you could have been the MVP of that finals had, had we won it, yeah. man. But, uh, that's not that's know. not what my goal was, yeah. you know? Yeah. I, I, yeah, we'll never know. But my goal was to simply, man, pop that champagne, man, and still be in New York. Yeah. Tough, tough one, man. But Harper, yep. I definitely appreciate you giving me the time. Anytime, brother. Uh, we, we've been trying to do this. I'm yeah. glad we got an opportunity to do it, man. And keep doing what you're doing. You do an excellent job in, 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 in what you're doing, man. I think people think that what you do is easy. I know better. I've been trying to do this stuff. <laughs> and every day is a different freaking day, man. So keep doing your thing. You do an outstanding job. Thanks a lot, Harper. And if you need any help, anything I can do, man, just let me know. Yes. All right. All right, Let's man. See. Take it easy. Thanks All again. Right. Is this the highlight of professional career? Oh, I definitely is. I've never been to the finals. I made it to the Western Conference Finals. My coach now eliminated me from that. And, uh, a great opportunity. I'm really looking forward to it. This evening they have been severely outplayed by the Knicks. Hopper again. 13 points for Hopper. And he brings the Knicks within three. In the early games, his jump shot was falling. Now he's challenging Kenny Smith because Smith is putting more pressure on him. Harper's doing what he should do. Take it to the defense. Yeah. Took him out of position and that's how He had 20 rebounds the other night. Hopper with a beautiful ball play. 